Welcome everyone to our webinar. I'm Lily Belfi. I'm chair of the AUR Wellbeing Committee and I'm a musculoskeletal and emergency radiologist at Weill Cornell. Um, I'd like to um, first introduce my co-moderator, Lori Diet, who is professor and vice chair of education um, in the Department of Radiology at Vanderbilt, where she's also vice president for continuous professional development. Um, we represent sort of the AUR and APDR um, joint effort um, spearheading this webinar, um, which is entitled Burnout and Depression in the Radiologist. Um, the objectives for this session are to demonstrate an understanding of burnout and depression, to identify causes of burnout and depression in radiologists, and to develop methods to address the causes of burnout and depression. I'd like to introduce our two uh, amazing speakers for today. Um, first is Dr. Samuel McQuiston, who graduated from the Louisiana State University School of Medicine in New Orleans in 2000. He completed his diagnostic radiology residency at the University of South Alabama in 2005. His interest in burnout and depression in radiologists is both personal and professional, as he has an undergraduate background in counseling and psychology. He formerly served as the Assistant Dean for Graduate Medical Education and Program Director for the Diagnostic Radiology Residency at University of South Alabama, and is currently the Associate Professor and Vice Chair for Quality Improvement and Education in the Department of Radiology. He has counseled many on addressing burnout and depression in their lives. Our other speaker is Dr. Edgar, Edgar Finn, who received his medical degree from the University of South Alabama College of Medicine in 1988 and completed postgraduate training in psychology and child and adolescent psychiatry at um, University of Alabama at Birmingham and Vanderbilt University. He's an assistant professor at the University of South Alabama College of Medicine Department of Psychiatry and the program director of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship Training Program. After joining the University of South Alabama faculty in 2012, he developed an interest in burnout and depressive disorders in physicians through his work with psychiatry residents who often found themselves struggling with depression and burnout. So welcome uh, to our speakers and welcome to all of our participants. And with that, um, I'd like to get started. Ed, why don't you take it away? All right, I'll share my screen here and uh, we'll get rolling. And is that coming through all right for everyone? Okay, let's get started talking about um, depression and burnout, uh, two subjects that are close to my heart as a program director, uh, dealing with um, uh, not just residents, but uh, fellows and also medical students who also deal with these issues as well, uh, as, uh, as well as some of my colleagues. Uh, first off, let's talk about the more serious of the two uh, issues involved. Um, because I think we need to kind of lay the groundwork for um, for the causes of depression. Uh, likewise, uh, this will have something to do with the causes of burnout as well. But there's a basic truth in psychiatry that there are basically three reasons, three primary reasons that anyone uh, develops a psychiatric disorder in the first place. This applies not just to depression, but also anxiety disorders and uh, any number of uh, mental illnesses. One is genetics and physiology, organic causes, neurotransmitter abnormalities, medical illnesses. Uh, something physical can happen that can lead to a depressive illness. Um, secondly, uh, developmental causes include things like challenging life circumstances, uh, adverse experiences, uh, history of trauma, history of abuse, neglect, and that sort of thing. Um, and then the third thing uh, that can lead to depressive illness is the, um, the level of current stress. And the current stress can either be acute, uh, something that's just happened, or it can be something that's more chronic, um, more like a slow burn. Uh, generally speaking, it's the interplay of these three factors, genetics, um, uh, organic causes, developmental causes, and current stressors that lead to the development of um, any psychiatric illness, including depression. Um, I think, uh, to oversimplify uh, and to say, oh, the reason I'm depressed is because of my work, or the reason I'm depressed is because of um, uh, the stress that I'm under, probably oversimplifies things. I think a lot of people might be um, uh, uh, prone to develop uh, depressions because of various reasons, but in general, we think that uh, depression is an overdetermined illness. 
Burnout, in essence, is a state of physical exhaustion, mental exhaustion, and emotional exhaustion. And it's brought about by exposure to excessive and prolonged stress. Uh, burnout is both a subjective feeling, uh, you can feel burnout yourself, but it's also objective. People can see that your performance might not be uh, quite up to where it was before. Uh, physical symptoms are often part of burnout. They can include somatic symptoms, difficulty with sleep, difficulty with appetite, um, and uh, let's see. Who can see this transcript recording? I'm not sure what that was. But uh, you can see uh, somatic symptoms, vegetative symptoms, difficulty with sleep and appetite. You can see emotional changes. People can become very irritable when they're burned out. Um, and uh, people can have difficulty enjoying things. People have difficulty finding the joy in their life. And behavioral symptoms are fairly common too. Um, causes of burnout include lots of different things, but they can include things like heavy workloads, time pressures, uh, a lack of support from, from above, organizational support, uh, a, a loss or a lack of autonomy, difficulty with finding the balance between what's going on at work and what's going on in your personal life at home. Uh, and also uh, it can be brought about by just simple poor uh, self-care skills. All of us need to um, incorporate good self-care skills. And sometimes that takes the back burner uh, when, we're, uh, when we're busy at work and maybe even overwhelmed at work. Now, the differences uh, in burnout and depression are several. Burnout is a condition, and it usually is brought about by this prolonged stress that we've been talking about. It tends to resolve. Burnout tends to resolve when the stress is relieved. Uh, depression is a much more complex condition. Um, indeed, it's a DSM-5 diagnosis uh, as opposed to burnout. And depression is more akin to a disease state. Uh, it tends to persist for a, for a long period, on average, at least a year, if not longer, uh, when depression is untreated. Burnout can be uh, one of the stressors that leads to the development of a depressive state. In other words, what I said about the stress diathesis applies here. Burnout can be one of those stressors that relates to the, um, uh, the onset of depressive illnesses. Um, and burnout can lead to disinterest in activities, decreased capacity to function, uh, decreased self-satisfaction, self-esteem, irritability. All of that is part of a depressive state. And so someone who is experiencing burnout could very well look like someone who's experiencing depression. And it could be uh, uh, sometimes difficult to sort out those two. Uh, talking about stress, uh, there are various kinds of stress. There's good stress, there's tolerable stress, there's toxic stress, and you may have your other adjectives for stress. But a good stress uh, or a stress uh, involves rising to meet a challenge, having something difficult in front of us that seems challenging, that we feel like we, can, um, we have the expertise, the knowledge, the wherewithal, the time to take this on. Uh, and we often experience rewards uh, after uh, going through a stressor like this. I often think of uh, a youth stress as going to the gym and doing a, a good workout. We often feel better after the fact, While it, whereas during the workout itself, we might be struggling. We might be breathing hard and having a difficult time, but after the fact, we feel better about it. Those are good stresses. Going for a nice long walk is usually a good stress. Tolerable stress refers to those situations where something difficult arises, uh, and if we have the support of uh, our family, friends, our peers, our colleagues, if we have a uh, good brain architecture, um, this stress is tolerable, uh, but it might be difficult for us. These things can be more like growth experiences, and they don't turn into something negative necessarily. However, toxic stress is when bad things happen and we don't have the support from the organization, we don't have the support from our colleagues or peers, our brain architecture might be affected negatively. We might come into this with um, uh, less capacity than we would have otherwise uh, because of the chronic stressors we've been dealing with and so forth. So these would be toxic stressors and more likely to develop into actual illnesses. Some of the neurochemical effects of stress. Um, uh, stress is not just a, uh, an emotional thing. It can also uh, uh, impact us uh, or an organic level. Stress induces the activation 
of the sympathetic nervous system, the HPA axis, the immune system, metabolic hormones, um, all kinds of molecular processes within organs. Stress impairs the prefrontal cortical function through high levels of monoamine and cortical release. And uh, the prefrontal network uh, connectivity is negatively affected. Prefrontal firing is suppressed. Uh, and these are the same kinds of things that strengthen operations in the amygdala, which is in a less, less evolved structure, the amygdala more of a, uh, of a primitive structure. Uh, and more attuned to primitive condition uh, behavioral responses than our prefrontal cortex. Um, so we end up working uh, at more primitive levels in our brain, the more stressed we are. Uh, chronic stress and glucocorticoid exposure leads to retraction of dendritic spike, uh, spines within the prefrontal parietal cells and expansion of dendrites in the amygdala. And so the more stress that we have, the more likely we are to to react more primitively. Excitatory amino acids, uh, mainly glutamate, uh, play a role as well. Overflow of glutamate has been shown to play a role in animal models in depre with depressive states and also uh, in dementia. Uh, physicians are particularly prone to burnout. Uh, I'm using 2019 data here because I kind of wanted to go pre-COVID, uh, COVID being somewhat of an outlier. Um, I think that in the years to come, we're going to find ourselves back in those pre-COVID um, uh, uh, pre COVID numbers more likely than not, because COVID was uh, an extremely difficult period of time and uh, still continues to this day. But I think we're going to move back towards more of a midline that seems to be somewhat of an outlier. Uh, a survey of physicians uh, uh, looked at 29 different specialties, found the highest rates of burnout uh, in neurology, neurology, nephrology, diabetes, endocrinology, family medicine. Radiology is about 46%. 46% uh, of individuals endorse um, signs and symptoms of burnout. That puts radiology right in the middle of the pack. Lowest rates were in preventive health, or, I'm sorry, yeah, preventive medicine, public health, uh, ophthalmology, orthopedics. Um, and uh, so I think you in the uh, field of radiology would find yourself right there where everybody else is pretty much. Some symptoms of depression. I feel as a psychiatrist, I have to go over this uh, with, uh, with first virtually every group that wants to talk about depression because uh, depression is a serious illness. Uh, it is not just sadness, but it's uh, symptoms of um, both mood and somatic nature uh, most days and um, uh, most throughout the day. Um, and it, it includes not just sadness and hopelessness, but also irritability. Irritability tends to be more prominent in younger individuals. Um, as we get older, we become better able to express um, our uh, emotions of sadness. Uh, but uh, in my work with adolescents, I deal more with irritable adolescents than I do sad adolescents, quite frankly. But irritability is part of this as well. If you find yourself becoming increasingly irritable, then you need to take, uh, take note of that. A loss of interest or pleasure in most normal activities can occur as well. Uh, uh, in particular, and most prominent, uh, a, a decrease in libido. Libido tends to be the most sensitive indicator of a, uh, uh, the onset of depression. Uh, decreased in interest in your hobbies, things you used to enjoy. Um, decreased interest in the sports that you might enjoy. Um, having uh, sleep disturbance is also a part of depression. Um, either too much sleep, sleeping a lot, uh, a lot more than you used to, or sleeping too little. The idea here is that an uh, individual with depression frequently uh, has a change in um, their sleep pattern. And generalized fatigue uh, can occur. Uh, appetite uh, generally decreased, uh, but you can have increased cravings for certain foods as well, especially carbohydrates. Uh, so we frequently will see people with um, uh, weight loss associated with depression, but on occasion we'll see someone gaining weight with depression. Uh, who are, these are individuals that tend to have cravings. Uh, anxiety, agitation, restlessness, difficulty with concentration, difficulty making decisions, uh, feelings of guilt, feelings of worthlessness, unexplained physical symptoms, somatic symptoms like back pain, headaches, um, and even thoughts of suicide, death, and, pre and morbid preoccupations. And obviously, um, 
the suicide rate uh, in depression is uh, fairly significant. Some points to ponder, major depression is one of the most common psychiatric illnesses uh, in the United States. It affects about 8% of U.S. adults. That's 21 billion cases in 2020. It's a lot of people. About two thirds of these actually seek and receive treatment for depression. Uh, and the downside of that is about a third of them don't. Um, a 2016 study uh, at uh, uh, that was uh, posted in the uh, General Hospital Psychiatry Journal indicated that individuals with anxiety and depression die uh, almost eight years earlier than other persons. 3.5% of deaths in the population were attributable to uh, anxiety and depression, at least to some extent. Uh, the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey indicated 12.7% of ER visits indicated depression in the medical record either current or historic. Uh, the same survey indicated 11% of physician office visits uh, uh, showing depression in the medical record. Uh, and then suicide deaths, unfortunately, 48,000 um, suicide deaths in 2021, about 14.5 uh, per 100,000. And that's a CDC um, number. Most with depression will manifest symptoms noticeable to others in day-to-day -day practice, but unfortunately, a lot of people uh, suffer in silence and don't really feel necessarily, feel like anything is going on. They don't uh, have perfect insight, uh, but their work will suffer, social activities will suffer, relationships with others suffer. Uh, there's something different. Uh, if um, uh, people with depression find that sometimes they make more errors or mistakes, they tend to be more forgetful, uh, they avoid uh, various kinds of things that used to uh, bring them joy, like social events. Uh, they frequently will have relationship issues with their uh, family, with their supervisors, their peers, their colleagues. Uh, exercise of poor judgment is very common. Many will feel generally miserable uh, or generally unhappy, but they won't really realize uh, why they feel that way. Um, and uh, for the most part, uh, uh, People who are uh, suffering with depression will find that uh, uh, the more isolated they are, the more unlikely they are to uh, have inputs from others, uh, connections with others that can help them to realize um, that they're suffering, that they're struggling. And there's no way to know really if somebody is um, suffering with depression without connection. I think uh, one of the unfortunate things, and Sam and I have talked about this a lot, one of the more unfortunate things is that the more isolated we are, either in our day-to-day -day activities um, or our social life, the more isolated we are, the, the more uh, disconnected we become. And that level of connection uh, can sometimes be a, a real benefit to um, both identifying depression as well as dealing with depression. Uh, things that hinder our connection with others um, tend to uh, exacerbate issues related to depression. What are some of the barriers to uh, connection? Well, there are a lot of uh, modern circumstances. I, I didn't realize as a psychiatrist just how isolated um, that a lot of times radiologists feel that they are. Um, but uh, the isolation is a very common phenomenon with diminished uh, human interaction. Um, a lot of times I understand you have to work in, in these individual workstations which accentuate that isolation. Uh, you have increased expectations for productivity, uh, increased work volumes, uh, constant interruptions throughout the workday, your phone is going off, messages, emails, things like that. Uh, really important uh, messages you have to return right now, right when you're in the middle of something. It's going to be very annoying. Uh, and these situations might sound familiar to you. We also have this as well, maybe not quite so bad as uh, uh, you in radiology, but we in psychiatry also deal with the same kinds of things. Uh, some of the remedies that we can look at when we look at the specific ways to target uh, burnout and depression. One is to identify uh, what motivates you as an individual. What motivates you? What are the intrinsic motivating factors in particular? The intrinsic factors uh, seem to be the most important. And that uh, intrinsic factors mean something um, almost philosophical, uh, finding meaning and finding a purpose in what you do. 
uh, trying to remember why you do what you do, what led you to do this work. Uh, research does indeed back up the privacy of intrinsic motivating factors like a sense of purpose or calling uh, over extrinsic motivating factors, which can be things like salary. Uh, connection with others also uh, is a remedy. Uh, connections with peers, connections with coworkers, connections with colleagues, uh, feeling like there's somebody else in the same boat can be uh, a very positive thing. Uh, and that suggests to some extent that there needs to be something called a work-life balance. Uh, likewise, self-care is uh, very important and doing things for yourself that can help you to uh, decrease the likelihood that you'll develop these symptoms in the first place. First place. Uh, that's a little bit harder uh, to do than it is. It's easier said than done, as they say. Uh, but a mindful exploration of your own values, your own goals, your own visions Having someone to help guide us sometimes is helpful um, as a psychiatrist. Having uh, a coach or a therapist sometimes is very beneficial, uh, or at least a trusted colleague or a mentor uh, in your life that can be very helpful. And it's always important to remember that uh, depression is a treatable illness. Burnout is, to some extent, uh, something that we can uh, we can do some things about uh, at some levels, especially on the level of self care. And with that, I want to turn it over to Sam and let him get started with this part. Thank you, Ed. Just uh, one quick thing. Um, please feel free to enter any questions or comments you have uh, using the Q&A button uh, as we continue with the second portion. Thank you. Uh, Sam, I think you're muted. Yep. All right. Thanks, Lily. Appreciate it. Okay, so I want to thank Ed for joining us today and providing this foundational understanding of burnout and depression. I appreciate him taking his time to be with us. I also want to thank the AUR and the APDR Wellness Committees for sponsoring this. This is an incredibly important topic. So in preparation for this presentation, I reviewed dozens of articles and texts on the current state of burnout and depression in radiology. I also interviewed radiologists, residents, academic faculty, private practice docs. Um, and by no means is this presentation going to be an exhaustive list of neither the causes nor solutions for burnout. There are things that I'm not gonna talk about. Not every presented solution will apply to every person or practice. You will have additional thoughts. So I would encourage you to use the Q&A feature to if there are potential issues or solutions or resources that you're aware of, please include those so that we can um, create a shopping list, so to speak, at the end of the presentation. Um, and you may not be the person to implement these ideas at your institution, but at least you become a messenger and an advocate for radiologists' wellness. All right, so I have no relevant disclosures. And as Lily went over the objectives at the beginning, I won't read these. I'll be focusing on the second and third and mostly. So in considering burnout and radiology and the causes, they can be grouped grossly into these six categories. Overload, lack of connection, lack of control, insufficient reward, lack of fairness, and conflict and values. So we're gonna go through each of these in sequence and cover uh, and some of these do overlap. So when I started talking to radiologists, I talked to several of the radiology faculty and our private practice radiologists that I'm, I know, and I asked them, are you doing the job you thought you'd be doing? Back when you were applying through ERAS or whatever mechanism it was, are you now doing what you envisioned when you were a fourth year med student and trying to figure out what you wanted to do. So one of the radiologists stated, our practice has increased year over year volume every year for the last 15 years without a change in staffing. Sound familiar? At the same time, the hospital has taken physical space away from radiology and postponed upgrades to systems. We are sardines forced to do more with less. And another one said, I'm doing the job that I thought I'd be doing, but I didn't expect the volume and the number of hours it takes to get through the pack list. This is the world that we now live in as radiologists. So this is an article from a healthcare magazine, um, and it talks about 
Um, are we overdoing it in changes in diagnostic radiology workload over the 2010 to 2020 years? Um, the healthcare system has become more dependent on diagnostic imaging over the last three decades. We've all seen you know, images from the emergency department that we're not sure should have been taken. Along with this, radiologists have seen increase in the complex cross-sectional exams that we do, specifically the advances in CT, MR, PET. We've gone from having a brain CT of 10 or 12 images to four or five series that are 20, 15, uh, 20, 30 images um, a typical PET CT could cover 1,200 images, and we have to scroll through these. In addition to that, as the population ages, their need for imaging has increased. Distinguishing acute from chronic issues takes time. Um, and this is directly from this article. During the last decade, the number of CT and ultra examinations nearly doubled from 87.4 to 155.7 and 52.1, to 86.5 per 1,000 patients between 2010 and 2020. And while x-ray examinations has decreased, those are the easy ones to read. Usually they're fast and they're short, whereas the ultrasounds and the CTs take a lot more time. So we've got more time required. And I put this up in jest, but often radiologists do feel that the door to the emergency department and the admissions hospital is through the CT scanner. How many of y'all remember WKRP? In addition to the increase in demand, we've not seen a comparable increase in the number of radiologists in the workforce. So this RSNA news blog post um, basically gave us that framework or had these various experts, uh, program directors, whatnot, talking about it. And um, the demand for imaging is outpacing what we're doing on the training side. The number of radiologists in the workforce is not growing as fast as this population and the demand for imaging. Over the past five years, the ACR Career Center has consistently listed more than a thousand posts for jobs for radiologists. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic in 2020, April 2020, the post declined to about 700. But by August of that year, it had already gotten back up to 1,000. As of this morning, it was 1,368. And that includes diagnostic radiologists, interventional radiologists, and nuclear medicine physicians. And then, as I mentioned, as the patient population ages, we're having more imaging, but so have practicing radiologists aged. So according to the AMA, 53% of radiologists are over 55 years of age. 82% are over 45 years of age. And many of these people will retire or reduce their hours in the next decade or so. So the, the, the workforce is not increasing and it's aging. Both issues we have to address. Based on the NRMP data, we're training approximately 1,354 radiologists per year between the various specialties. And the number of radiologists has increased in training by about 2.2%. 5% every year over the last two decades. So we're increasing, but not nearly at the rate that we would need to keep up with the pace of demand. So, oops. So how do we increase the workforce? These are just some ideas. Um, we need to increase the number of training. The big issue is always funding. Who's gonna pay the salaries and the malpractice and cover all the administrative costs of training? How do we recruit volunteers to cover addition, added exams? So in, you know, rather than having it as a requirement, can we recruit volunteers to take extra shifts and do extra reading? Can we introduce efficiencies, add support staff? Is batch reading really a better way to do this than the way we're currently doing it, more like MAMO does in many institutions? Can we employ technology to make ourselves more efficient? So work optimization engines, computer-assisted diagnoses, is this gonna help us get through the work list more quickly? And as the uh, um, volume has increased, has the meaningfulness of our work decreased? How many times do we look at a study and think this study should not have been performed? And it appears to me to be a meaningless value. I am jumping a hurdle that shouldn't even be there. Um, 
and I'll talk about some of those issues there, but um, in many ways, it's a culture of overutilization. There's a lack of knowledge about radiology by non-radiologists. What do these studies do? Can I order this to cover my clinical question? I don't know. I'll just go ahead and order it, and the radiologist will give me a recommendation at the end of the report, so they'll figure it out for me. Convenience, you've got an inpatient. If we discharge them, they'll never get their staging CT for their cancer. So let's go ahead and do it now. And then there's the CYA, and I'm hoping that all of y'all know what that stands for. Medicine, where things are ordered simply to protect the ordering physician from the litigation that could occur just in case there's anything that I might miss. And we have clinical decision tools, such as the appropriateness criteria, image wisely, image gently, that are prov provided to attempt to help clinicians when they're ordering these things. But many physicians are not aware of these, and those who are haven't adopted them depending on their previously established habits. Change is difficult for all of us, especially when you've been in a career for a length of time. So what are realistic expectations with increased volume, stagnant workforce? decreased reimbursements, we're still uh, expected to perform our job, to interpret these exams, perform these procedures while maintaining our turnaround time benchmarks and our QA metrics. It's kind of become a radiologist kryptonite. We have to have resilience. We have to make it through this. Radiologists are mostly overachievers. You didn't get to where you are by being Joe Blow. And we have our internal and there are external, external expectations of our excellence. So these expectations play into the, the, the mindset that we are um, working with. Any AED exam that takes more than an hour is considered to have caused an excessive delay in patient care. Anything we miss while flying through the exams becomes an incident report and it gets turned in for a complaint. We're not Superman. We can only do what we can do. In most groups, there are go-to people. These are those who tend to, um, others tend to turn to when they have problems. They're the people who have a reputation for being able to solve and address issues effectively. That dependence on them puts additional overload on those particular individuals. Some radiologists will not take time off because they feel that them taking time off is gonna impose work on others that they don't want to impose. So they will back off from taking a sick day and work from home just to cover so that somebody who, somebody else doesn't have to do their work for it. Um, rather than taking a vacation, they accrue weeks and months of PTO. Um, they don't take time off. They experience the angst about what's gonna happen when they're away. Um, they don't. They can't get through the work list by the time they're supposed to go and pick up the kids or get supper ready. So they log in later and wind up reading exams after hours. And I've seen reports signed off at my institution after midnight by people who took their work home. And then there's the second victim. And this is something I've not seen much about. Think about the work list that you go through, especially if you're in emergency medicine, neuroradiology, pediatrics, all these atrocious things that we see, and we subconsciously suppress our response to this, but um, I'm sorry, we consciously suppress our response to this, but subconsciously we're in that same boat. We're seeing this atrocious thing that has happened to this person. When we're young, it's easy to take granted our health. It's easy with every passing year to downplay our own wellness and happiness as we altruistic take care of others. Um, but we have, to, we have to put our health as part of the process. If we're not healthy, if we're not taking care of ourselves, we're not going to be able to take care of others. So how much downtime, how much disconnection do we need? Um, there's an, uh, an article in the Muse that introduced the 5217 rule. And this is a concept, they uh, quoted a study that was done in private industry that it they analyzed computer work behavior through an app called Desk Time. And they isolated the top 10 users as far as productivity and watch their work habits. 
The study then analyzed their computer use behavior during the course of the workday. And it showed that their workday was divided into average 52 minute sprints of purposeful work and 17 minute breaks. And they, they tended to spend those breaks away from the computer. So the point then would be to leave the packs behind, go to lunch, go take a walk, go outside, see the sun, watch the rain, and then come back a little bit more refreshed to finish it up. And then how much vacation time is needed? This study, the effects of short vacations, vacation activities and experiences, they basically compared short vacations of four and five days to long vacations of 10 to 14 days. And planning several short vacation periods across a work year may be an efficient remedy to preserve health and wellness. Those four to five day units provided as much re-energy re as the longer ones did. And we often think it's the other way around. One of the things that I do is um, try to practice digital disengagement. Um, I recently went to New Orleans with my family for a weekend. I did not take my laptop and I silenced my phone. So unless you were a family member, you were not gonna get through to me that weekend. And it was extremely affected. And then I plan distraction. This is a Spotify playlist that I have and it's public so you can see that. I'm not sure if you can see the titles, but this is my motivation playlist. It's uh, um, 266 songs and I call it popular songs with positive messages. It's not about the genre, it's about the lyrics. And so there's every genre you can think of in here from classic music and Broadway to country and hip hop, it's all there. It's about the lyrics. And that's one of my mechanisms to bring it back in. And then practicing digital courtesy. Don't send an email or a text message after hours on the weekend when you know that person is not there. But you can schedule an email to go out whenever they return. And usually most people will put, if they're away for any length of time, in their email so you'll know when to actually schedule that. And as... Ed mentioned the opposite to the disconnection is actually the lack of connection. Again, going back to that question at the beginning when I talked about, are you doing the job that you thought you'd be doing? One of the radiologists stated, I left a toxic radiology practice to work for a teleradiology service. After the newness of working from home wore off, I found that I missed the interaction with colleagues and the sense of contributing to a group. I wasn't ex expecting the level of isolation that I felt. And that can be a big deal, especially for those who work remotely. And as Ed mentioned, COVID has kind of accelerated some of this stuff. Um, and we're now more isolated in radiology post-COVID than before. The Perils of Isolation is an article um, from the AJR a couple of years ago. And they talk about remote reading and the impact of it. And one of the quotes from it, no field in medicine and least of all radiology, the most interdisciplinary of all medical specialties is an island. And so we've, we, we've got technology that allows us for this enjoyable practice of being able to work from home, but what is the price that we're paying for that? So with the lack of connection, we lose that connection by working remotely from other radiologists, from the referring physicians, and then the residents will often feel abandoned. They're isolated in the room by themselves and there's no attending around for them to refer to. And for the radiologists that are listening today, think about 20 years ago, we had film. There was no PACS. The team had to come down and see you because you had the pictures. So we've lost that. We only have a few docs that now will stop by to go over their studies. So maybe the older crowd is feeling this a little bit more. Standard of care. That refers to the degree of care and prudent and a prudent and reasonable person would exercise under the ex whatever the circumstances are. It's a medical legal term. I'm gonna shift that and we're gonna look at the standard of caring. Coretta Scott King made this statement, the, greatest of a, the greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. So how do we put the community in place? 
show up in person for these events, remote only when necessary. I don't go to tumor board at my institution because it's at the other campus. I save that 10 minute drive and the 10 minutes of finding parking. I do that on a regular basis, but faculty meetings, conferences, other meetings, I will attend simply for that face-to-face -face and that networking. Check in with people. If you know somebody's been struggling, if you know they've been going through a change in life, uh, uh, newly married, newly divorced, new parent, check in with them. How are you doing? What do you need? Engage in bonding activities. Rather than sitting in your office for lunch, grab somebody and go to the cafeteria. It may not be the best environment necessarily, but at least you're taking that moment with a colleague. Attend departmental and institutional events. So again, physically be there. Promote self-care, both your own and others, and create peer support groups. And one of the things that we're going to be rolling out fairly soon is peer support groups through the APDR. So look, look for that information coming out soon. And then lack of control. Um, the only constant in life is change. We feel that on a regular basis, especially in the field of radiology, it seems like just as soon as we get all our equipment upgraded to the standard of care, some new technology comes out and we start the process all over again. And then as radiologists, we have to learn these new techniques and these new imaging modalities and figure out what does each of these diseases look like because nobody's ever used this. So there's constant change for us. Um, the evolving diagnostic guidelines, you know, 20 plus years ago, we started with BIRADS. Now we have dozens of different guidelines and categories that are useful for uh, imaging and trying to be as objective as possible. We have to keep up with those. The developing AI component of this, a lot of the younger radiologists are worried, is my job going to be secure in the long term? Is AI going to replace me? And then the changing pay structures. If you've been in medicine for any length of time, you're never sure as what I'm doing today going to provide me a livelihood in the future at an expected level that I can understand. So the lack of control often comes because radiologists are often excluded from decision-making processes. Um, space allocation in the hospital. The hospital administrators may not even confer with radiology to know what do you need until after they've made the decision and then they're scrambling to try and fit you in a corner somewhere so that you can read studies. Um, all of the interruptions that we get during the uh, trying to interpret studies, the phone's ringing, you've got the ED wanting to get their their study now, you've got an ultrasonographer who's stopping by because she's got a finding that she can't figure out what it is and wants to see if you want to, you know, come and look at the patient yourself. Um, and then you've got the uh, difficulties in contacting people for results. So you've got a critical result. You may not know who it is that you actually need to contact. The ordering doc was there at two o'clock last night. Now they're at home in bed and somebody else is taking care of that patient. Who do I contact? And then the inappropriate imaging, as I mentioned, it can be very, very frustrating. And it feels like you have no control of the situation. You're just caught up in this whirlwind of change. So intentional engagement. Create an environment where people want to stay and strive. Active listening. Get engaged with the players who are making decisions. That way you can then be part of the shared decision-making process. Time management skills, all this triage and multitasking, there, there's a lot of time management skills that can be applied in that. Learn those, get those, and build resilience. And resilience in some ways is about a part of a perspective. How do I view my role in this conglomerate of machine of, of medicine and healthcare? How can I then, with that perspective, realize I am important and this is what I do? I mentioned the firefighters before and going on to the insufficient reward element. Um, Simon Sinek, I don't know if y'all are familiar with him. He's a YouTube personality and I love watching his, his talks. Um, he made this statement, a pizza party for a good job is not perceived as a reward. You know, lunch is great. I, I like getting free food, but it's really not the same. Applauding people for specific performances, describing, it's kind of like feedback for a resident or a med student. The more specific 
that feedback is, the more likely they're going to perceive it and be able to gain from it. A reward of applause, the more specific that is, hey, you did a great job, that's fine. But if you can give qualifiers on what that means, that helps. And then recognize the firefighters. Know who those people are and provide them support. Sufficient reward is more than a paycheck. Yes, financial remuneration is important. But that individual performance, as I mentioned, the validation of the value to the group, you were important to us because this is what you do for us. Again, recognizing the firefighters, promoting respect from the non-radiologist, especially from the administration. That is something that we actively need to, to strive for. And then there's the legacy drive. Um, for those of you who are in faculty, think back over the course of your career. How many radiologists have you taught? How many imaging studies will those radiologists read over the course of their career? That is how many people's lives you will have touched. That is your legacy. And that's an incredible motivator for me. Lack of fairness. So does everybody perceive being treated the same? Are they perceiving that? In-house procedures. So you've got a bunch of faculty or a bunch of radiologists who are remoting, but somebody's got to be in the house for the orthogram. Somebody's got to be in the house for the esophagram. Are those people being concentrate, uh, compensated for doing these procedures while somebody else is reading studies? Those duties often have a lower RVU. Those of us who are pulled away from our interpretive and procedural duties to do administrative things, how, are, how is that being uh, reimbursed? Um, and do these individuals get recognized and compensated for that? The firefighters need support. Um, they need to know that their efforts are noticed, that they're not just problem solving and addressing issues without somebody noticing it. Um, perceived cherry picking. If you have somebody who picks the easy studies and the short studies so they can get through and, and accumulate their RVUs, is that being addressed? That's where some of the workflow uh, efficiency op, uh, applications come into play. Full-time versus part-time. Is there a distinction? If the part-time is only there half of the time, it's perceived that they get many, many days off. Um, and then parents versus non-parents. Um, one of the groups that I'm in, we have a difficult time figuring out when to meet because a couple of them have children in the morning that they have to get ready to go to school. So before they go to work, they don't have the free time. So we have to figure out how to make that happen and make it uh, appropriate for them. The perception of fairness is often about how we see things. Equity and equality are not synonyms. Value, acknowledge, and reward each person's role equitably. We're not all the same. We don't bring everything equally to the table. Acknowledge each person. And I probably should not have put protect the firefighters in there quite so many times. But to me, that's a key, key person because in every group, there are the people who are the firefighters. They're the problem solvers. They're the go-to people. And they're dealing with probably more stress because they're dealing with everybody else's stress as well as their own. And then keep the perception in mind. As I said, it, we're not all equal. What can this person do or not do? Are they limited in any fashion? Do they have ability to optimize in any fashion? And de, de incentivize cherry picking, both in the type of studies and in the scheduling. Conflict and values. We've got a, just a few more minutes. Um, so these are two quotes from one, two of the radiologists that, again, going back to those interviews that I did before. I value teaching students and residents. My department and institution only values RVUs. I do not have dedica dedicated time to prepare lectures. The other, they expect blood from a turnip. If I'm busy barely keeping up with the patient care activities, there is no time to teach or do research, but the expectation is still there. So in my mind, I went into radiology as an academic radiologist because of the teaching element. If I don't have the time for teaching and if I don't get appropriately compensated or acknowledged for that, it devalues what I do. And so that value of like an educational value unit, an EVU, is extremely important concept.
awareness of meaning in life is protective against burnout. So going back to what Ed said earlier about work being meaningful, and we've talked about how often when we're grinding through these studies that we perceive as being inappropriate, that it devalues that moment. And I don't intend to simply imply that we resign ourselves to just the way things are, but an awareness of the situation is needed. So from this article, program directors who are more aware of what makes their life meaningful reported lower levels of burnout and fatigue and greater quality of life. Why did you become a radiologist? Why are you doing what you're doing? And, and I've asked this question. There was a bit um, in preparing for a presentation I did uh, about 10 years ago, I asked every radiology faculty member in my department, if you had to choose your specialty again, would you choose radiology? There were no exceptions to this. No one would have considered any other field. All of them would have gone into radiology because they that's what they are, it's what they do. In, and others may know otherwise, but I, we've only had I only know of two residents who've ever changed from radiology to another subspecial to another specialty. I can give you dozens of examples of the other way around. So value reconciliation, how do you deal with when your values and others' values don't align? Where, where can we come to common ground? So going back to that meaning of life, if this is my value and what I, I'm, I value, how is that affecting what I do? How is it affecting how I perceive what I do? It then becomes a situational awareness of my values and their values are different. We need to have open conversations about those differences in values. We need to acknowledge those differences, but then try to incorporate those differences into the group priorities. Can we both have our values recognized in mission statements, in strategies for our programs. So from this article, um, I wanted to make this quote from Radio Graphics. Organization-based interventions have been shown to be more effective than individual-based interventions, contributing to the evidence that burnout is ultimately a systems-based problem. So we need to be able to advocate in our institution to address these concerns on a more global way than just one person at a time. So how do we recognize depression? You may recognize these four people. They look like they're doing well. All four of them committed suicide at a point in their careers when people thought they were on top of their game. So what do we look for? Um, change in behaviors. Is this person different than what they are? Are they acting out of self? Lapses in professional behavior can often be a manifestation of burnout and depression. They're not, they're, the mind is not where it needs to be. They're responding uh, in a very untypical way of them. Withdrawal from enjoyable activities, loss of appetite, irritability. Are these part of the typical behavior? Is this just a fussy person or is there something else going on? Emotional outbursts, emotional distancing, they withdraw from the group, forgetfulness, confusion, poor hygiene. These are just some things to take note of. And then how do we respond? De-escalate the situation if, at, 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 if possible. Establish trust with the individual, listen to them, reassure them that what they're going through is a normal consequence of where they are in life and provide them the support that they're gonna be able to get through this. Do, I think we need to discuss mental health openly. I freely and regularly talk about my own issues with burnout and depression. It is a common thing and ignoring it doesn't make it better. Check-ins, as I mentioned earlier, when you know people are going through life changes or are struggling, check in with them. How are you doing? What do you need? Hey, let's just go to lunch. And then appropriate referrals. When a person is at a point where they truly do need medical assistance, when they need someone like Ed Finn to walk them through this, figure out what's going on, and render an appropriate care plan, and that may include things like cognitive behavioral therapies, but it also could include things like medicine or other therapies that they would need to access. 
And then finally, I just want to mention a few resources. This is not exclusive at all, or all inclusive, uh, but this is a snapshot from the ACR's Member Resources Benefits Wellbeing page, just to let you know that there's lots of stuff there. And the PDF, Doing More With Less, if you've not read it, you really do need to look at it. It has got a lot of information in there, and it will tremendously help. And then you can often just look up wellness and radiology either on Google or in PubMed, and you'll get a, a lot of references and resources on things that other programs, other individuals have done that you could easily introduce into your institution. So with that, these are the various references, and I'm going to turn it over to our moderators. Again, thank you for allowing us this opportunity for this extremely important topic. Hey, I want to thank you so much, Sam and Ed. And I also want to say I may just be in, uh, maybe we can stop sharing screen if we would like, unless you want to leave the references up for a minute. Um, but I may just be part of that older crowd that um, that read films. I grew up reading films. And there was really something special to the day that the rounds, they had to come through us, right? And so we got to see groups of people. Of course, we didn't have the same number of studies to read back then that we do now. So, but I do, that goes to me, there was some real value to that. Um, I did want to ask Sam, I saw one of the questions mm -hmm. and they asked what's on the bottom of your shirt. So I wondered if you might be willing to stand up and share. <laughs> we asked the same question before. <laughs> so that's the shirt. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Uh, we are going to. I bought this shirt specifically for this moment. <laughs> so thank you. So we're going to move into the Q and A. Um, we we really just have a few minutes, but I think that's okay. Would we? Uh, so let's see what questions we may have. Uh, are there other questions other than the shirt? <laughs> Let me see so far. Because I have a question that we could um, start with, and the other thing we did want to invite you to do is if you have some resources or anything you'd like to share just throw that into the q a and um and then we could put together a coll you know to collate them for uh distribution after the webinar um so my question is um managing stress seems easier said than done and i'm wondering what specific techniques um you might use like uh, to decrease job related stress um, we know I, it's going to be there. And so that's the question. I may be able to feel that one. Um, I think uh, knowing uh, all these things and not being able really to, on a, on a organizational level necessarily, uh, change things today. Uh, what can I do to manage my stress right now? I think there are some very simple things that everyone ought to do. And uh, that is to think about their, their regular routines and diet and exercise, for instance, and making yourself um, potentially as resilient as you possibly can. And if you haven't found a relaxation technique, if you haven't um, figured out what works best for you to do stress management, I think that's very important. And uh, you, it depends on the person. Some people may find that meditation is very helpful to them. Some people may find that engaging in one of their uh, hobbies that they used to engage in really brings them a lot of joy. Uh, if you've forgotten how to do that, then one of the things you can do is what uh, I think, uh, let's bring mental health to the front, uh, to, to, to the forefront here. As a psychiatrist, I've been in therapy since I was in my 20s, and um, I don't go to a therapist because I have serious problems or issues. I go to the therapist sort of like someone goes to a personal trainer. I think that it helps me to maintain some strength, uh, emotional strength, and some psychological strength that I might not have otherwise. And so I, I, I'm a hearty advocate for people engaging in therapy, even if they don't have a quote unquote diagnosis. You know, I think having someone you can communicate with and talk to confidentially can be very helpful. I would add, I would add to that. Um, I think there's two kind of roles here. Absolutely, you need somebody who is a professional on the, the mental health field so that they can touch bases with you on a regular basis. But I also feel that you need mentors in various things in life. Every time you face an event, uh, a life stage changing thing, you probably know somebody who's already been through that. Touching bases with them and it's like, I'm feeling this. Is this normal? 
you know, I feel angst against my kids because I never get time away from them. Is that normal or am I just a bad person? And having somebody to put a perspective outside of you in that is tremendously impactful. Thank you. And let's see, um, we are going to have to wrap it up, but let's just, I do see one thing about the APDR peer group um, and when is the rollout. Um, and I can speak to that for just a minute. Um, uh, so we just received, it's actually funded by a grant and we just received notification um, of approval for uh, funding. And so this is, um, will be coming from our APDR wellness committee. And um, and I don't even know the exact timing that'll be rolled out. We have to kind of organize things next, okay? And it, part of it may be geographic and Sam's already done something like this. And so we're gonna be tapping at Sam's part of this. And um, so I, I'd say in the upcoming months, um, I maybe an, op, you know, an optimistic time might be January. <laughs> and I'm just gonna throw it out there, but I'm but without any guarantees. So we're, but we definitely think this is gonna be um, really a great way to connect and support each other. And we're looking forward to it. I think that we're running out, our time's about up, okay? And so I want to thank, first of all, I want to start by thanking Ed, Sam, Lily, um, <laughs> for, um, for you know, all helping to come together to put this together. And Ed and Sam for your outside, uh, outstanding presentations. Thank you. Um, and then thank I'd you. like to thank all the participants. You know, thank you for joining us. And um, we, uh, we really like it that we were able to do this jointly with the AUR and APDR. So thank you. And I hope this was as interesting to you as it was to me. I really enjoyed the talks and I wish everybody a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye now. Bye.